Hi, I'm Wendy Ann Seal. And I'm Tanya Bayer. Welcome to The Pink Corner. When I first heard the news that I was diagnosed with cancer, I was really shocked. I was, because I was a new mother, I just had a baby um, and it was nowhere on the radar. So because it was breast cancer, it was a case where, you know, there's a lump in your breast, but it's, I'm breastfeeding. This is part of the you know, process. So for me, it was a huge shock being diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I discovered the lump myself and went to the doctor days before traveling overseas. And um, so I did not have any clue what this was. It was about three months after feeling the lump that I had a my first visit to the doctor. She told me that she had to, she felt the lump. She told me she would um, insert, you know, aspirate the lump. Mm -hmm. And um, if it comes out wet, it will be just a cyst. But if it comes out dry, chances are it is cancer. It could be benign or not. And um, she, she, um, took out a bit of that lump, we ha did the lump, I had a lumpectomy, mm -hmm. and the results came back, and I just smiled when she told me. You smiled? And she says, and you're <laughs> smiling? <laughs> she said, and you're smiling? But I, I suppose it was what I was going through in my life that allowed me to be able to smile, smile yeah. when she said it, and I, I was not scared, but it still was like sur a surreal experience because you're not looking for yeah. anything like that in I your was, life. I, I must say my process was a little different. I, I kind of, what triggered it for me, the whole knowledge of was that I started to lose a, while, a lot of weight. And as you can see, I'm not a big person to start with. Yeah. So I started to lose a lot of weight and this was in 2020. And 2020 was a difficult year for everyone. Mm -hmm. So I was losing a lot of weight and I wasn't really, you know, because I was like, this is COVID, I'm a new mother, I had so much going on. Um, but then it was like, it started to get to the point where it looked like I started to look unhealthy. Like, <laughs> so yeah. I was like, let me go and check out this weight loss thing. Because this, this is not me, this is not right. So at first it came that uh, I was anemic. I was like, okay, cool, take the iron tablets. Mm -hmm. But then I was still losing weight. So right. she, then the doctor is actually who found my, my GP. She's awesome. And she sent me for the ultrasound. And then it came back as looking requiring further investigations. So then she referred me to a surgeon um, who did the sound, the, what do you call it, you know, the core biopsy of it. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, they did the whole process. And even up to that point of the biopsy, I was convinced, convinced that this thing was going to come back benign. Because in my mind, I'm like, this is something associated with breastfeeding, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm like, yeah, this yeah. thing coming back be nice. I was completely unbothered because I was 100% yes. confident Mm -hmm. that it was benign. Yes. So when it came back as otherwise, I was yes. floored. I'll be honest, I was floored because it was uh. so left field for me because at no point in my mind had I entertained mm -hmm. the thought of it being a possibility. Yes. So when it came back, I was like, <sighs> I was, yeah, shock, shock. I, I guess you're taking me back to um, that experience in the doctor's office when she inserted that needle and it mm -hmm. came out dry, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, you think of other people with cancer, but not you, you know? And like you said, I was thinking that, no, it can't be cancer, you know, it can't be cancer. I didn't, the thing is that I didn't even think when the doctor called me into her office, I was seeing her privately, mm -hmm. but she called me into her office on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. It did not even occur to me that something had to be a mess. Pretty normal, yeah. You know, so um, yeah. So I, I guess you you normally think of other people experiencing things like cancer, but not you. Yeah. You know, so that's true. But but I believe I was. I was prepared in a sense because of, of, of where I was emotionally, spiritually. I think that I was prepared for anything. Mm. So that's why I said that 
I was able to, to smile. smile because I, I felt that there was something to this. There was, it's, a, it's a journey that I would be on, but I felt that I would, it's something that I could overcome. Oh. Right? So I, I, I reached that place far, far down in the journey. Right. Right. <laughs> I, would, I didn't yeah. start there. I didn't start there, but I got yeah. there eventually myself as well. Well, for me, when I got the diagnosis about my, that I had cancer, it was really rapid fire from there because I guess, not I guess, because of my age, the approach to it was like, oh, we need to do stuff now. So it's like, yes, this is comfort, this cancer, and we need to do staging, and there's all these tests that you have to do now, you have to do all these tests now. So, you know, how soon can you get to get this done? Can you go next week? How soon can you get It's like this whole barrage of things that you know have to do to, to stage, as they call it, because the diagnosis is just the first part where they come from. Oh, this lump is definitely cancerous. Then they do the staging where they, you know, kind of identify how far along you are, what is fueling the cancer, if it's estrogen or whatever it is, and all these other tests. So it was just, you know, for me, it was this whirlwind after I got the, the diagnosis. Yes, yes, very true. Um, I remember I was diagnosed on the 28th of October. I was diagnosed in October too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I think that was a Monday. The doctor was ready to do surgery on the Friday oh, of yes. the same week. Yes, I mean, it was quick. <laughs> um, only because the theater was not available was I put back till the okay. other week. So uh -huh. on the 8th of November is when I had the, the surgery for, um, for the uh -huh. cancer. And as you said, then it was the whole thing about getting the samples uh -huh. um, checked out and, and so on so that they would know the, the treatment process and, and, yeah. and all of that, yeah. Yeah, I pushed back on mine because first when I, they, they got the, you know, you got the stage, you find out how far you are in terms and all that stuff and then the doctor's first thing is you know you're young so we recommend you remove both breasts i'm mm. like hold up <laughs> you hold up no 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 <laughs> it's like it'd yeah, be fast with that one i was like yeah. you know what and they want to do surgery like two weeks from now and stuff i was mm -hmm. like no no because by the time i went through the whole because my process was different i did the core needle first Right. Then you had to wait for those results to come back. And then I did the whole staging with the CT scans and all this other stuff. And because I had a pre-existing heart thing, I had to start seeing a cardiologist as well. So it was like mm -hmm. other factors thrown in thrown yeah. in there as well. So I was it, it wasn't like around December when I had finished all of that, that they wanted to do the the surgery. So it all felt like a whirlwind to me. So I was like no, I'm not doing surgery in December. I want to spend the time with my son and be able to enjoy Christmas. And we can start 2021 with all of these things that need to happen, but it's not going to happen in December. Mm. Well, for me, it was a bit different because I um, was listening to what, and to what the doctor was saying to me <laughs> and how she was responding to what presented itself to her when I got into her office. One of the first things she said when she examined me is, why did you stay so long? Mm. The lump was big. As I said, I found the lump myself um, in July, just before leaving. Mm -hmm. And um, when I called to make an appointment to see the surgeon, I did not get an appointment until October. And because of how I felt, as I said, I was in this spiritual place that caused me to feel that, look, I'm at peace. I found the lump when I was at peace. So mm -hmm. therefore, God's got this, <laughs> you know. So I chose to wait till October, right? So by the time she examined me, the lump was large, mm. right? Um, I think it was about an inch, right? Okay. And um, that is why, that, that's the reason why she mm. wanted to do the surgery so mm. quickly, right? Yeah. So um, after that, it was about determining what the stage was, what the grade was, and whether I was her to new positive, mm -hmm. negative, you know, whether it is whether I could be treated with estrogen, progesterone, whatever to help with the treatment of the cancer. 
Say, if you don't mind, what was your stage? It was stage three okay. and grade three. Ah. Grade four and grade, grade four and stage four, as you know, is the last mm -hmm. stage. Right, so I was grade three, and I was also, I was also triple negative. Oh, oh, you so were special. So there was yes. no no um, progesterone, yes. no estrogen was able to help me. So my, st I was at stage two when I got back the, you know, the stage and results of mine. Um, I can't remember to what, but I know for me one of the things that caused the urgency was because of my age, you know, being under forty and diagnosed with breast cancer, there's this sense of urgency because it's considered abnormal. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. growing up cancer was something, particularly breast cancer, that affected older persons. It wasn't something mm -hmm. that people that, you know, under 40 and stuff like that were going to yes. be diagnosed with. So yeah. my daughter was concerned that given that I had cancer at such a young age, it kind of is an indication of it being aggressive. Mm -hmm. So you need to treat yes. it aggressively. So that's right. why yeah. he was like, let's go and have surgery now. Let's cut off both breasts. And, oh. like, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, no, no, sir. No, we're not doing it now. Yeah. And we are not cutting off both breasts. Yes. <laughs> so that was yeah. the whole conversation we had because yeah. I I did a lot of research when I found out about my diagnosis because yes. I, I don't, for me, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. I want to know. Yeah. I want to know so that I can understand what is happening, what is being done, what is the plan. Yes. So I did a lot of research and even though I knew where he was coming from in terms of his suggestions with doing it now and stuff, I think in the end it's a you know a personal thing you have to make and you have to do what you're comfortable with. Yes. And I, I was not comfortable. That felt extreme to me, mm -hmm. given you know where we were. I'm like I came from a family with no history of breast cancer, yes. so I have the honor of being the first one in my family to ever have honor. breast cancer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the honor, because it's it, you know I, I I use that word for a reason. I will yeah. explain you know later, yeah. but there so it was he was because of that history and stuff that he was like okay we need to get on this because it's not even a case where it is something that is genetic and in your family so yes. but then i was like you know we could wait one month can't kill it was already december mm. i was like we could wait let me just run through christmas let me enjoy christmas and then we could start the okay. new year with that and everything else i had a completely different attitude for <laughs> <laughs> because I felt that this was an invader in my body that needed to be gotten rid of. So, <laughs> so I was all about going through the, the surgery mm -hmm. immediately, as the doctor had, had recommended. Um, I had to have both, my, both, both breasts um, removed eventually. Mm -hmm. It was not the original plan, mm -hmm. but I eventually had to have both of them removed. I also was, I was diagnosed at um, 45, mm -hmm. but after that I had two other diagnoses. The, the second one um, cost me the other breast. Mm. But the interesting thing is that after the lumpectomy, which, which, which um, came with the first diagnosis, that breast was just so painful, really? so painful. And it was turning like black. And I was what? happy to have it removed. Oh, wow. I was happy. The painkillers I was using wasn't um, working much. I was happy to see it go. Well, I could imagine, yeah. Right? Yeah, but. Because um, I had the lumpectomy and it was, I guess for me that felt like such a seamless, Oh. I, that, I must say, I always say that the surgery set me up. Okay. I wasn't ready for what came after because the surgery, my surgeon is awesome. I will call his name. His name is Dr. Ian Lewis. He is a wonderful person and a great doctor. Yeah. So for me, the surgery was so smooth. Like mm -hmm. I literally never felt any pain. So I was like, ooh, I got this surgery. I got this cancer thing. Beep. Surgery. Check. And I was like, so next up was chemo. So mm -hmm. for me, I gone in chemo fearless. Cause I'm like, this surgery was a breeze. The mm -hmm. surgery you had, are, are you speaking mm -hmm. of the, the removal of the breast? I didn't remove my breast. I didn't do the, oh, the, the lumpectomy. Yeah, I did the lumpectomy. Oh, okay. So I was okay. like, listen, right. listen people, a young, mm -hmm. 
Just take out what you need to take out. Okay. We are keeping these two things. Yes. Just take out what you need to take out. That's right. If it is God's will and something else happens and I need to take more drastic action, I yes. will do so. But yes. at this point, yes. just remove what you need to remove. Yes. And that is the option I went with. Yeah. And I and that just went like my recovery and everything was so yeah. smooth. I felt like you. Mm -hmm. I felt because the doctor gave me choices. <laughs> do a lumpectomy or um, what was it again? I can't remember. I can't remember what it is, but mm -hmm. the, the lumpectomy was one of the choices. And I, or, she, or it was that she would either do, she would do a biopsy, she would take out a sample mm -hmm. and send it to oh, see yes. what. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was either that or do a lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I chose a lumpectomy mm -hmm. because I figured take out the lumpectomy, do the lumpectomy, and, that'll be the end of it. and that would be the end of it. <laughs> I was yeah. so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and for me at that point, it is, I have a very small family. So mm -hmm. I confess something now. It is no no, um, but I told my family about my diagnosis the night before I did surgery. Wow, you held it. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so of course my, my partner knew. Mm -hmm. So he would have gone with me to all of my doctor's appointments yeah. and all that kind of stuff and but I just decided because I know my family be so you know families are yeah, they're so yeah. concerned especially my mother and given that my family my mother and my brothers all live overseas okay so I know it was gonna be this whole thing yeah. and I was like you know what I'm gonna be selfish and I'm gonna just deal with this because I didn't want to have to deal with other people's emotions and mm -hmm. you know reassuring other people or even their so I was like, literally the yeah. night before, I call a family meeting. It's like, okay, okay people, we need to have a meeting, have okay. something to discuss. Yeah. And I kind of dropped the bomb and roll out. So, so yeah, so I'm in surgery tomorrow morning. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'll talk to you all after. Right. So that caused a little bit of um, confusion wow. in the family, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, yeah. But that was just how I, th how I felt like I needed to, to, to deal with it, you know, yeah. just so I wasn't trying to manage other people's emotions and expectations yeah. at that point. I was still very much wrapping my mind around mm -hmm. this whole thing and how, how it would affect me as a new mother and, you know, yeah. what this means. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to, so to deal with all of that. When I received the news my hus about the diagnosis, my husband was out of the island. We, have two, we had three sons at the mm -hmm. time. We had, we had our three sons. So my husband was out of the island and I didn't tell the boys anything. Mm. So I called him and I told him what the situation was. And he said, but you got to tell them, you got to mm. tell them, you know? So I did, I did tell them. The first son was, um, let me see, I have to count. My last son was five years old mm. at the time. The second one, was would have been around 16 i think and the oldest one would have been about 18. all right and the 18 year when i told the 18 year old he said um i know that already who do you know he said the thought just came to him mm. one day that his mother had cancer i don't know when he got that thought and mm. i guess he just um programmed his mind to deal mm -hmm. with it, should it happen, right? The second one shed some tears. And of course, a five-year-old, you know, he wouldn't know no, anything that's going on yeah. about that yet. But, um, but my husband was very, very supportive. Um, he stood by my side. He went with me to all the sessions, all the chemo. Well, yeah, he, w he was there during the chemotherapy mm -hmm. sessions. I got my first, first cell phone because this is way back in right. 2003. Ah. He got my first cell phone at that time so I could call him after mm -hmm. the chemo sessions to come and pick me up from, you know. Um, and uh, my mother, as, if, as you might um, hear from my accent, I'm not Barbadian by birth. Mm -hmm. My mother is in Trinidad. so. My mother, she's our angel. She heard her child is going through this and she t turns up in Barbados to mm -hmm. lend whatever support she can. So I had support all around and, and there were friends who, um, who I didn't tell, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. One particular friend who I did not tell, but he noticed that something was up. Yeah. Something was wrong with, I don't know, because, you know, I hope I'm not going too far ahead, but um, like when I was going through um, radiotherapy and feeling so weak and he observed that something mm -hmm. was going on and would not stop until I told him what it was. But then he and his wife chipped in to take my son to and from school. Mm -hmm. You know, so the support was all around. It's very, yeah, very, yeah. I do not know what I would have done. Like, like I said, young mom, my household is literally just my partner, me and our son. It's right. a very small yeah. household. And my partner is the only child. And like I said, a lot of my uh, family is overseas yes. and stuff. Um, I have like an aunt here, a cousin here, an uncle here. Stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it was a case where literally it was the rallying of everyone. Once yes. everybody knew, mm -hmm. the people that I told my mom, and so I was like, please do not come. <laughs> I was like, please do not come. <laughs> do not come, mother. I got this. Do not come. I will keep yeah. you updated. She was not happy about it. She still talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, but she honored my wishes. Mm -hmm. And the family here were like literally there for me. And my best friend, my best friend, she's awesome. My woman researched and she here. Ginger tea is where you're supposed to drink when you're getting through chemo. Mind you, I allergic to ginger, yeah? My woman bring in ginger in every form. She's like, well, try the tea, try the mints, try the tea. I'm like, ginger is ginger in any format, but okay, you know, I, we can try this and figure it out. Yeah. She brought me like coconut water all the time, fresh yeah. fruits. And like I had friends, even workmates, they were so nice. I had workmates like, cause again, the young son, so my partner would have to be dealing with the baby and take him to daycare and cleaning and all that kind of stuff he's doing. So I had like some of my workmates who are also friends would chip in and make sure I got her appointments, particularly when I had chemo and stuff going on. So they yes. would take me to chemo or pick me up from chemo mm -hmm. and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was like literally a village, yes, everybody yeah, involved. Yeah. Like my friends would make sure I got her appointments and that, you know, if we had to shop or needed groceries, people would pitch mm -hmm. and bring groceries and oh, stuff so it was very good. yeah i have some really very my good. tribe is awesome yeah I got, yeah mm -hmm. i got some good people i got some very good people around me so that was and that made it lighter you yes. know because then you don't yes. have to worry about other things i was able yeah. to really just focus on me yeah. and and getting and getting better for me chemo was a real real rough spot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really rough like I said surgery set me up yes. I thought I had chemo beat before I even start chemo <laughs> because surgery was so easy yes. but then when I had started chemo I was like oh my god mm -hmm. chemo f lured me I legit spent most of my time in bed in pain mm -hmm. like bone deep pain I couldn't walk I was I was a wreck Mm. During chemo, I was like, I was completely, chemo was yeah. really difficult for me. And, and that is where the support system really came in. Because mm -hmm. even with my partner, he recognized I wasn't able to contribute anything to the house. Yeah. You know, I can't look at my baby. I can't breastfeed. Mm -hmm. I can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. So he was like, made sure. He's like, you know what? Just go in this room. Almost like I got my own little room. So I like right. moved in this room mm -hmm. and he just made sure like he did all the cooking, brought the food, made sure everything was staying. And I was just was able to just stay in my room and kind of recover when I felt well enough to come out and enter. Mm -hmm. I did when I didn't, I yeah. kind of just, mm -hmm. just relaxed. But like I said, I was, chemo was unexpected and it was humbling because mm -hmm. I went in so confident that I had yes, this and yes. I was so unbothered. Mm -hmm. And then it started with the AC chemo mm -hmm. and it was to the point where like, as you know, because, you know, AC chemo is red. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I legit would start to feel nauseous anytime I saw anything red, any red liquid. Mm. I could not consume anything red. I couldn't be around any red fluids. It was, mm -hmm. it totally wrecked my mind. Yeah. <laughs> this chemo, I just like, it did a number on me mentally yes, yeah. as well. So yeah. it really, it shook, it shook mm -hmm. me, chemo shook me. Well, so I was mm -hmm. like, but then once I got through it, I was like, girl, they ain't got nothing that this world could throw at you that you cannot handle. I was That's like, they ain't got too. nothing that could come that mm -hmm. you can't deal with. So after that, I was like, I the boss. I yeah. am the <laughs> boss. They ain't got nothing, nothing that could come now yeah. and do anything. I, I got through cancer. I got through chemotherapy. 
and yeah. AC chemo that a lot of people consider to be the worst form of chemo that there is. So I was mm. like, I was like, yes. After that, it was like after finishing chemo, I was like, yeah, I got this. I got this. And not just this in terms of cancer, but life itself. I was like, there is nothing in life now that I can do, or there's nothing that will ever be too big a stumbling block for me. Mm -hmm. So that was like, so mm -hmm. that's why I say the honor, you know, earlier I talked about the honor of being the first, because I was always a confident person. I was always very outspoken and stuff like that, but I felt like this diagnosis leveled me up. It sounds weird, but I felt like it was, and it also helped me get closer to God again. Because I had started to stray, mm -hmm. and and it was not during the process, but only afterwards that I kind of think. And I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. As you said, all of this was for a reason. Yes, There's yes. a purpose behind all of this. Yes. There is a reason why you had to walk this path. And I feel like now I am stronger and an even better version of myself than I was before. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, maybe this is what I had to go through mm -hmm. to get here. Yeah. So I... I, ha I, I don't, I'm not upset. I am mad, as people would say. I'm mad. <laughs> I am mad about it. I'm yeah. not mad about it. Yes. Uh, it reminds me of a verse I read just this morning, that we are salted by fire. Mm -hmm. Words of Jesus, we are salted by fire. And it is cancer for me, going through the cancer experience, helped me to deepen my faith. And I would say, not that I started off, this is before I felt the lump. I was in a state where I could not pray. I didn't know what to read in the scriptures. I felt far from God. But through a process where he brought me back to himself, I experienced such a beautiful connection with him and a peace. So when I felt the lump, there was peace. Mm. I was not afraid. I knew that God was with me, right? And throughout the journey with cancer, God was present. I told you, you talked about not wanting your mom. I was happy that my mom was there <laughs> because she was like an angel for us. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time when I, the first session of chemotherapy, I said to my husband, you know, I forgot to tell my mom what I wanted for lunch. And I described this soup with no meat, mm -hmm. um, broccoli, never put broccoli in soup but <laughs> I just wanted soup with broccoli and the vegetables and so on and when I went home without having told her a word she had the soup prepared exactly wow. as I had described it you know so that was just a small bit but it's faith in God showing me how to cope mm -hmm. with cancer showing me what to read to set my mind on on him and not on the disease, you know, um, my faith, faith in God. And, and it is not anything. I don't know why it happened. I don't know if it's because other people were praying. I don't know if it's because of, of my own relationship with him. I don't know. But everything that could help me mentally, emotionally, to deal with cancer was given even direction as to how to eat mm. you know i struggled with that you know i struggled yeah. with that myself yeah. personally because like during chemo i unfortunately was that person that everything tastes terrible like everything yeah. was metallic i couldn't yeah. get yeah. so i lost even more weight during chemo i like yeah. dropped to below 100 pounds i looked i used to tell everybody look at uh, i'm a what's called this thing now a q-tip Big head, big feet, and it was middle, <laughs> tiny in the middle. I said, I look a cute. <laughs> and plus, it was bald, you know, so it's like, yeah. I look a cute. Yeah. But I couldn't, like, nothing would stay down. I was just like, everything tastes terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So I couldn't find, you know, anything that, you know, you would think that there's maybe one or two things you would find that would be that thing that you could eat consistently and you'd yeah. be good. Mm -hmm. I never found that thing. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad that. That's why I love talking to other people that I've been through. Mm -hmm. I find it's such an individual experience that mm -hmm. like you, both of us had the some sort of AC chemo. Yeah, I had. We yeah. both we learned we both had the same oncologist and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the experiences and everything is so unique, so different. Every like cancer is such a unique and individual mm -hmm. experience for each person, mm -hmm. regardless of how similar your diagnosis may sound or even your treatment is is like is so unique to each person because everyone 
deals with it differently. Everyone interacts with the drugs and everything differently, even their interactions with the support staff around them. It's so different. So that's always very interesting yes. for me to hear from other people. Actually, the oncologist said that to me. Mm -hmm. He said, do not compare yourself with anybody. You know, you will have your experience. And he wanted me to trust him with whatever he was telling me <laughs> to do, <laughs> right? But, but he, he mentioned that, not to compare yourself with anyone. Yeah. And even from you know, sharing with you, I realized that our experiences were different, mm -hmm. right? I, for me, um, during chemo, the f your food was bland, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it just didn't have any taste, you know? Um, but then I found that I had the, the, the problem with nausea. My experience was not as bad as yours during mm -hmm. chemo. Um, so I started to um, look at the things that caused me to feel nauseous. Certain mm -hmm. foods I knew I had to stay away from, like mm -hmm. greasy stuff and mm -hmm. so on. And I was also instructed to drink a lot of water while, while yeah. going through chemo. Um, I did that. And um, so, you know, you, you, you begin to learn the sort of things that you need to, to avoid, tolerate, yeah. right? And, um, but as far as, as far as being told what to eat, I remember, but I know that the oncologist mentioned a lot of greens, a mm -hmm. lot of like broccoli and green, green vegetables and so on, you know, because you, you need the antioxidants. Mm -hmm. anyway. But out of my experience with God, he told me about using things like berries and strawberries mm -hmm. and blackberries and things like that. So I used, I used things like that, mm -hmm. you know, and well, like I, look, for me, even with the nutrition part, because like I said, I, I research everything. Yeah. Um, even before I started chemo, I was like, okay, they have to have foods out there that I can use yeah. that would better prepare my body for chemo right. so that I go in. Because, you know, everybody knows chemo pulls you down. So I'm like, mm -hmm. let me build myself up right. to prep so that when it pulls me down, I can still be at a certain level. And I actually went to... Um, cancer support services, mm -hmm. I found they were very helpful okay. for me. I, I, the cancer support services is who I turned to when I wanted the information about stuff like that, like nutrition in preparation for chemo and yes. stuff. And they gave me information, okay. which I found very useful, suggestions for things that you can take mm -hmm. to try to yeah. minimize you know, the impact. Unfortunately for me, my body was just insistent on being rebellious. Yeah. But <laughs> I actually found those services to be very helpful Oh. for me. After experiencing cancer, I said, if I can face cancer, I can face anything. And so it made me stronger spiritually. The other thing that happened is that I realized that I need to be purposeful about fulfilling my purpose in life. So um, I cut out Anything that I felt was not in keeping with what my purpose was, and I focus particularly on those things I believe I'm called to do, right? That's one major thing that, that um, happened after cancer. There are a number of things that I have not mm -hmm. yet done. Um, I knew I wanted to share my story. I was able to do that in 2022. That was... 20 years after my first diagnosis mm -hmm. and um, there are some other things since then that I have on the charts that I know that have to be completed before I leave this mm -hmm. but basically made, it made me more purposeful about living and fulfilling that call. I love that you know what your call is and you're pursuing it. Yeah. I, I want that for me. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love that. And, and like I know that there was a purpose to this. I'm still searching for what it is. For mm. me, I feel like God has built a soldier. Are you ready for the war? Where yeah. the action is? I'm still waiting to figure out where the action is. Where mm. am I to be deployed? Yes, <laughs> so yes, yes. that's yeah. what I'm waiting to figure out. So I haven't, I haven't had that moment yet to know yeah. what it is. But like you, I feel compelled to tell my story to people. So I, yeah. I shared on social media after I was diagnosed, mm -hmm. not after I diagnosed, after I complete treatment. 
I shared what I went through on mm -hmm. social media and stuff. And through that, I was able to make contact with other people who were going through the same thing. And then I also try to be, I've always embraced life. But now it is even more so. Like, now I'm like, this is such a gift. Yes, and there is, is nothing that could happen that would ever make me think anything else. Yep. You know, so it's like, this is a wonderful life. Yes. It is meant to be lived, it is meant to be enjoyed, yes. and it's meant to be experienced. Don't just go with the flow and just, you know, float mm -hmm. along. Just yes. embrace it, grab it, and just enjoy your life because yeah. it is a gift and anything that you're going through. My, my takeaway for this and why I will tell people is anything you're going through, you got this, man. Yeah. You got this. There is nothing that you will experience that you cannot overcome. So don't ever yes. think there's anything more than you, mm -hmm. you got this, you mm -hmm. got this. So if you are fearful of doing any testing or anything, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. There's never been an instance where not knowing, particularly in health situations, has turned out for the better. So when you have that information, then you can take the necessary action. And it is not gonna be anything more than you can bear. Have faith in yourself, have faith in your ability to overcome. You can, you can. You can. Don't ever let any other thought cross your mind. Mm -hmm. And just go and get your test done. Mm -hmm. Be regimental about it. Do it. Do it at the same time. Be consistent with it and take it seriously. And if you find anything, just like Wendy and I did, we may have delayed a bit, but we took our action. You know what I mean? So take action. Do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Handle your business. And, and I think I, I would add to what you say that we need to also have faith in God. Yes. Right? Um, and with the expectation that God could show up for you. And that is my story. God showed up for me. Because when I was diagnosed, you know, I felt I, as a Christian, I felt as a good Christian that I needed to accept a diagnosis of cancer as my lot in life. Mm -hmm. If it meant death, I felt that that's what it is. But the experience that I had in dealing with it is that God showed me that I needed to fight. Mm -hmm. I needed to fight for my life, that this was not his plan for me. And then I need to remember that he is the same God who's with me in the bad times as in the good times, mm -hmm. right? And that is what kept me going. He showed up. He's a God for every situation, right? And because you're going through cancer does not mean that he's going to abandon you, he, yeah. right? And um, so, so I think that one of the things I would like to say to persons is to trust God, hear what he's saying, and know that there's purpose in what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Every experience, as you shared, has there is a reason why you're going through this when i shared my story in 2022 i shared the lessons not only the experience but i shared mm -hmm. the lessons that i learned through the experience of cancer and i also made the bold statement that i would not trade my experience mm -hmm. with cancer for anything in my life it meant that much. It was mm -hmm. that impactful. It was that eye-opening mm -hmm. for me. I would not treat it. Yep, I was reformed. I yep. reshaped. Yes. It is without a doubt. Yep. Into better, yes. into better, into stronger, into bolder. Yeah. So yeah. It, it is true. And as we were discussing among ourselves earlier, a cancer, uh, a cancer diagnosis, no, it's not necessarily a death sentence either. Right. It's not so a I, I want people to get that out of their head that they're frightened because if you get diagnosed, that means that's, that's not the case. Exhibit A, exhibit B. Th that is not necessarily the case. You know, and it's key that you take action. I, 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 let me say this too. I was diagnosed three times. Three times I had chemotherapy once. Mm -hmm. The first time when I went into radiotherapy department, I heard a voice saying to me, nothing in here belongs to you. I said, Lord, does this mean I should not have chemo? But I did, probably didn't have the faith to not go through it. So I went through it. But on the other two diagnoses, even though the doctor called in my husband, like he didn't understand that I understood the seriousness of what was happening. He called in my husband and trying to convince me that I needed chemo. 
I refused mm -hmm. it. I had it once. I was not doing it again, right? God communicates to me that I am healed. Even though there were two more diagnoses, I believed the original word that God spoke, I am healed. And he reminded me of a tree. And I'm saying this for somebody who may have had a first diagnosis and then another one. That could, that could um, shake your faith. But I believed what God said to me the first time. He said, you are healed. So I had, a, I had a cherry tree in my yard that I wanted to get rid of because it was diseased. Chopped it down and it kept growing. But I knew from, I knew from science, the tree manufactures its food in the leaves. So I said, okay, I pluck off the leaves. Every time it pushes up new leaves, I would pluck, you know, the leaves growing out from the stump. I pluck them off. Eventually, the tree died. So I had my first diagnosis, got chemo, got radiation therapy. Second diagnosis, no chemo. But I had the surgery, plucking off the leaves, mm -hmm. continuing to believe the Lord's report. Third diagnosis, same thing. Right? And I'm here. The last diagnosis that I had was in 2009. Mm. Right? That makes it 15 years. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it's a journey, yes. huh? Yes. It's, it's, it's life changing and it, it's a journey. I am not the same person I was That's right. before. Yeah. But I love who I am even more than I did before. Be assaulted so. by fire. <laughs> Amen. So I, I just, you know, it's, uh, there's so much to take away from, a, from, a, from our experiences and even a cancer yes. diagnosis. And I just yes. want anyone, you know, watching us and hearing us share our stories just yes. to be aware that yes. do not be afraid, you mm -hmm. know, take charge of your life, own your life. There is no do-overs. There are no second chances. So do not be lackadaisical about it. Take your health seriously. Yes. Do what you need to do. Yes. yes. You know and just have faith and, and grasp the opportunities that are given to you you know i was i was a part of a women's organization that needed representatives to attend um, a, a little seminar on self-examination mm -hmm. i was one of two persons that attended that and it was and since that since I'm um, understanding how to do these self-examinations, I started to practice it every month religiously. That's why I was able to discover the, the lump the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, so opportunities are coming f to, to us all the time. Go for your breast screening. It, it's free. Go and, and get it done. You know, continue to do the, the self-examinations yourself. You never know. It, it might, you might find a lump that may save your life. You know. yep. 